Good evening, everyone. Hi, Rishika Mutani. We are glad to welcome you all here in the session of Second Orient City Literature Fest by SCR Knowledge Foundation. This session will be of 40 minutes. Our topic for this session is the South African Indian diaspora is one of the largest population of Indians outside India. Our guest speaker, Zainab Priya Dalana, and our moderator, Bristi Sharma. Zainab Ma'am is a qualified physiotherapist, educational psychologist, and full time writer. Ma'am hails from the very world she richly describes in her novels. The rural sugar plantations, the tiny villages are the places of her history and lineage. Her debut novel, What About Mira, was published in 2015 by Penguin Random House South Africa. The novel won first prize in the Minara Literary Awards and was nominated for the Sunday Times Literary Awards and for the Edisola Prize UAE. She has published short stories and articles in the literary fiction journal in various newspapers and magazines in South Africa. She publishes opinion pieces in the New York Times, the Daily Maverick, the Post, and the Guardian. She was awarded an honorary fellow writing International Rights Program, University of Iowa, 2016. Now, currently serves as the editor in chief of the inaugural edition of the Durban Review Women's Anthology series entitled Drum Beats Writing from Women of Africa. Our moderator, Drishti Sharma Ma'am, is an aspiring journalist presently studying at the Asian College of Journalism. She has done her graduation from Bangalore and worked with various media houses like TV9, CNN, IPN, Times of India, and ABC. She is currently breaking the news on her Instagram platform. Besides this, she loves to listen to people's stories about their dreams, their struggles, and how they overcome. She chose journalism because she feels there are things that people need before forming an opinion. Unbiased reporting is one thing our country lacks right now. A pen can change a person and a country. Besides this, he's a Rajma Chawal fan and an angular enthusiast. She wants to change the world and put an end to starvation. He's extremely grateful to be in amidst of such luminaries and literature titles. Handing the session over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Tishika. So, now, uh, starting with the topic, so today South Africa is home to the largest population of people of Indian origin, numbering to almost 1.3 million Zedab. The majority live in the province of KwaZulu Natal. In fact, Durban is considered to be the largest Indian city outside India. Around the world, South, Africa, South African Indian community is associated with Mahatma Gandhi, whose 21 years in the country were formative in his mission to lead India's freedom struggle. The majority of India in South Africa came as indentured laborers. The community had to live with apartheid after indenture was abolished. The Indian community was categorized with the black population. So with this, the first question, my first question to you would be, is it actually true that there is no caste system in Indians in South Africa? Because from what I gather, Indians came in two waves in South Africa, one known as the Jahazi Bhais, where there was class but, though, but no caste at all. So is it actually true? Um, hi, Drishti, and hello to all the listeners. Yes, it's actually really true. Um, and they always have this thing that they say is that uh, when they cross the Kalapani, which was the black water, they drop the caste in the ocean. So that's like a, it even forms part of poetry and songs about how caste was thrown in the ocean. So in the ship, in the jahaz, there was uh, people from all different castes in one situation. And there was no space for anybody to have a higher caste than the other. And when they landed in South Africa in 1860, everybody was put together as one, Indians. And caste system didn't play a role. It never endured, and it's still to this very day, there is no caste. So since, since there's no caste system, is there any class system existing in South Africa in Indians right now? 
Yes, I would say there is a class system. The class system mm -hmm. is very much based on. Is basically uh, amongst all the South African people is um, who is economically better than the next. And the class system, uh, slightly, there's a class system based on language as well where uh, a large amount of the people that didn't come as Indian Indians, you know, after the laborers had come over, lots of people came to open businesses here and they're from the Gujarati speaking community. And uh, they, because they were economically more stable, were considered of a higher class. So it was that situation. Yeah. Okay, so coming to my next question, uh, despite apartheid being called off as a state policy in South Africa in the mid-90s, it is very surprising to note that Zainab's books, your two books, What Gandhi Did Not See and The Architect Architecture of Laws, hasn't been allowed to publish by the government of South Africa. Obviously, this begs the question of freedom of expression and speech in the apartheid-free South Africa today. How would you, in your words, explain this paradox? It's it's a huge paradox and it's something I struggle with every single day because um, I don't write with any amount of censorship. So when it comes to uncovering things that were part of a system, I, I can go as deep as possible and I do write about them. I don't think about whether such a book is going to be publish, publishable or not. And both my books were not taken for publication because they were both considered too controversial. So what I always tell people is on the surface, you know, what you see in the newspapers is that the state system is gone. But what we notice is that it's still there. It's still in a very um, sort of undercurrent that is, is still there. I'm not saying my books did not get published because I was non-white. My books didn't get published because I addressed a system that was already in place and I uncovered a lot of issues when it came to patriarchy within the African National Congress. And so uh, that's why the architecture of loss wasn't published. The book about Gandhi, um, unfortunately, the Gandhi family didn't agree with some of the things that were said in the book. And uh, even though they were based on strong research foundations, and uh, I always maintain that I look at Gandhi as a man who, in, when he was in South Africa, he was going through his evolution into his um, sort of enlightenment. So there were things that he did which may not have been the Mahatma that we know. But unfortunately, the Gandhi family didn't agree with most of it. And out of respect for them, I didn't pursue the matter. The book was not published in South Africa. It was published in India, though. OK, uh, so question related to that, apart from, uh, you know, you not having your books being published in South Africa, did you ever find any other issue regards to your personal freedom of expression or speech? Not related yes. to your books. Um, you know, it's, it's as a writer, if you if anybody is aspiring even to be a writer, you uh, you have to be very empathetic and you have to be someone who uh, gets very involved in the subject that you're writing about. And uh, even before I became a writer, I was very much an activist. Uh, even during the apartheid time, which I grew up in the apartheid time, so I know what it's like to uh, suffer under the, the under the uh, apartheid rulings. So I've always felt silenced. I've always felt that my um, my work, my voice, has always been silenced. But despite that, I keep writing and I keep uh, sort of pushing forward. I think the, okay. yeah, yeah, this. So now coming to your book, uh, The Architecture of Loss, what mm -hmm. actually made you write this book with apartheid as a backdrop? Um, you know, I was practicing as a therapist and during my therapy sessions, I met someone who was a very old woman. She was at the time in her late seventies and she was in an old age home. And everybody had forgotten about her. And I just met her because I was called in to treat her. And after talking to her, you know, obviously she was very, very heavily drugged and medicated. I, and after a few sessions of talking to her, I began to realize 
that she was one of the strongest and loudest activists against apartheid. But she had been forgotten and put into an old age home. And when I began to read her, learn about her story, I realized that I have to write about this. I have to write about how the women in the anti-apartheid struggle, including Nelson Mandela's wife, Winnie Mandela, were silenced. Sometimes the women would write the speeches and the men would go out and say them on the, on the stage. The women sometimes were told, you should be for cooking in the kitchen, even though they were the most educated and the most politically active, but that's what they were told. And when I heard all these stories, I began to realize that if I don't tell it, nobody will. If I don't keep her uh, version, her vision, uh, her version of what happened alive, nobody else is going to do it. So that's when the architecture of loss became an idea in my head. And I started researching. And it's obviously very fictionalized because I had to hide her identity. But uh, the characters in the book are almost like a combination of many, many women that were freedom fighters during the anti-apartheid movement. And they were very much silenced simply because they were women for no other reason. Yeah. So the characters in the book, Sylvie and Afros, are, hmm. you know, is enigmatic to the reader. Would you care to explain? Sylvie is uh, the mother and she is the more enigmatic character because uh, Sylvie is living a life of great regret. She gave her entire life to the struggle for freedom and democracy. And uh, in her late latter years, she realizes that that means nothing. In the end, she gave up her children, she, her only child. She gave up her marriage and all because she was a strong freedom fighter. You know, in the book, I say um, one of the leaders of the, the uh, anti-apartheid movement told everybody, you have to let go of your identity, let go of who you are, and you have to find, fight like one machine against apartheid. So Sylvie in this book is the one living with great regret. And Afros has a lot of anger because she was thrown away from her mother's life at the age of six. She had to live with her father who didn't want her. She had to live with a stepmother who really didn't understand her. And so it's only after many, many years that she goes back to the small town and meets her mother and uh, almost 40 years that the mother and daughter begin, begin to understand each other again. And it's a, almost a reconciliation of a mother and a daughter and reconciliation of the country told in, in, in the same, uh, almost in parallel, yeah. So what else I've gathered from this is that women, you know, women during apartheid gave away their personal lives and they've only, you know, yeah. carried a backpack of bruised memory or tarnished images. Am I right? Absolutely right. And I always use Winnie Mandela as an example because everybody knows, and, and for, with the greatest of respect, Nelson Mandela is one of the strongest and most famous freedom fighters in the world. He's taught the world about uh, democracy and fighting silently against a, uh, a system, against a rule. But many people don't see Winnie Mandela, who was his wife, a very young woman. She married him. She was still in her 20s. A young woman with two small children and having to live this life. She was also imprisoned. She was put into solitary confinement for 426 days. Uh, she was tortured and raped and beaten, but those stories don't come out because they, you know, it's the, the women are never given that much acknowledgement for what they did in the freedom struggle. And I always believed that the whole world knew about Nelson Mandela because Winnie Mandela told them. She went out there, raised her voice and told everybody that he is in jail. And if, if the world didn't impose sanctions on South Africa, he is going to remain in jail. And it's because of her loud voice that they released him from jail. She played a very strong role in our democracy. So it appears uh, bizarre to me that Afros, though being biological daughter of Sylvie, is you know enamored by her stepmom and yet is pursuing her biological mother's life. Hmm. What made Afros still go to her mother after being abandoned at the age of six? What exactly is the relation? Afros is, although she finds a lot of comfort in Mumi, Mumina, who is her mother, yes. her stepmother. Yes. Uh, her stepmother doesn't um, answer the questions 
Afroz has a lot of her mother in her. She wants, she's hungry for success. She's hungry for finding out about the world. And Mumina is a very uh, sort of simple woman. And all she wants to do is keep a very small home and just carry on with her life. So Afroz needs a lot of answers. I think she could never move forward in her life. She's always had failed relationships. She's had a very, um, she's fallen into depression. And she realizes that if she doesn't reconcile those feelings, and that almost hatred she has for her mother, she's never going to move forward. And uh, her mother is dying of cancer, and she realizes that now it's now or never. She has to. And then it does come out in the book, which this is a little bit of a spoiler, that um, which I suppose I'm going to give you a spoiler, is that Afros is pregnant, and she knows she's carrying a child. And if she's going to be a good mother, she has to connect with her mother and find out. You know, she, nobody can go forward unless they close all the doors properly and have enough closure in their past. They can't move forward into their future. OK, makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. we are in the 21st century. How would you describe South Africa politically and socially in this century? Um, look, that's a very tough question. <laughs> um, Currently, South Africa is, is experiencing a lot of upheaval. And it's been over 20 years since democracy. It's about 24 years now. And everything that was promised, you know, the rainbow nation and the glorious um, promises have not come to light. It hasn't happened. So the people are very angry. And one of the reasons it hasn't happened is because of corruption. So South Africa at the moment is just to, is, is trying to find its feet it's trying to fight things that have been in place for a very long time. So I think the positive side to that is that South Africans are always questioning. They're never silent. And um, I like that because it just shows that uh, despite the fact that we have now gotten our freedom, we are not um, accepting it as just the status quo. So the way I would describe South Africa is, is that we are standing on the cusp of being extremely uh, productive, but also extremely caught in the past. We're right there in the middle. I know it's like a teenager, really. We don't know who we are at the moment. We have lots and lots of issues that come to light, whether it's social or political. And um, on a daily basis, there's issues of racism that comes to light. And um, what I like is that it comes out. And there's a lot of fighting and things like that that go on, but it gets resolved. Uh, I don't see it changing. I think it's going to remain like this for a while to come. So a hypothetical question, Zainab. In the early 90s mm -hmm. or the period of apartheid, Sylvie is a strong woman who is a doctor and mm -hmm. a rebel. How would you portray her character in the present South Africa? That's, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, in the present South Africa, I would portray Sylvie at the height of her life, if I was to portray her in the height of her career, when she was prospering as a doctor, when she was fighting in the freedom struggle. I think I would portray her as somebody who is uh, very bitter and very disillusioned with the way all her fighting has amounted to nothing. And I think how I'll, and I don't want to say it that way. I wish I could say that I'd portray Sylvie as a happy woman living a great life, living with a husband and children. But really, um, that's not the situation. I think she's going to be a woman who, in this present today, living with COVID-19 and everything, she's going to be a very unhappy woman. She's going to be searching and she's going to be fighting, whether it be on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. Sylvie is going to be someone who raises her voice constantly about every single thing that she comes across. Um, but I also see that she's going to be silenced a lot because patriarchy is a very strong concept in the South African society, if not in many of the societies as a whole. In the South African Indian society, patriarchy and misogyny and chauvinism is still there, and it's really strong. We fight against this all the time. So what about the other characters in the book? How mm -hmm. would you explain them? If you had to explain each one of them in one sentence, how would you explain each character in the book? There's a, there's a um, domestic helper 
who is from Malawi, who is has become um, Sylvie's helper in her old, her old age. Her name is Halima. And I describe her as a very, very caring but strong woman because she had to run away from Malawi during, uh, you know, as a refugee. She's living in South Africa illegally as a refugee. I would describe her as the glue that keeps everybody together. So it's very strange that somebody from another country keeps, the, keeps all the South African people together like glue. Then there's, um, there's a male character in the book whose name is Seti. He is a very uh, flirtatious older man who doesn't know where he wants to be in life, but he wants the comforts and the you know the good things in life. So he he goes towards anybody that will give it to him. And at the at the time, he spends all his time with uh, the older Sylvie, trying to covet her like he is her boyfriend because he knows she will keep him comfortably. Uh, we have the uh, Afro's boyfriend, who is an architect from America, and uh, he is just in South Africa for the exoticness of it. You know, you get a lot of people who uh, from the from the West who go to South Africa, who go to India, and they want to see the exotic, and they don't ever want to see the reality. And so he, the moment he starts seeing the reality, he runs away back to America. And then uh, we have the uh, Mumi, who is just a very simple. Uh, comforting woman who all of us want in our life. Somebody, we always need a mummy who we can go uh, early in the morning and just hug this person after we've had a rough night. And then there's Afros's father, who is a very, very opportunistic, gangsterish type of man who tells everybody that he is a, um, um, a anti apartheid activist, but in actual fact, he's an opportunist who just wants to uh, raid and steal as much as he wants. As, as he can, yeah. Yes, can I continue? So your book has also received a commendation by none other than Salman Rushdie, who writes, Dala is a writer who has suffered much for her art and is well worth reading. Would you like to comment why he, used, said, why he said that you have suffered for your art? Um, I think he knows. Uh, and uh, he we've over the years, I've actually um, been in contact with him because when my debut novel, What About Mira, came out, I, I suffered a, a great amount of um, uh, trauma based on an incident that happened at a literary festival in Durban. And he reached out to me at that point. And many people said, go into hiding, take everything back, you know, just retract everything that you said. And I decided not to. I decided to push forward because when I say something, I don't want to backtrack. So um, he he reached out to me. The, the are you talking about the name of the debut novel? No. So I just yeah. wanted to know if he finds any kind of similarity in Indian and South African society's response to you know hard-hitting and eye-opening writings. Like, for example, yes. Rashdi shot to mm. fame because of one of his protests against yeah. his novels in 1988. Yes. There is a similarity. And also, you know, uh, quite recently I was writing on Kashmir because I was involved in, um, in uh, with a journalist that was uh, also, you know, he was very much actively involved just post-abrogation. And even though I'm a South African writing about Kashmir, I still received a lot of pushback 
from various communities, both in India and in South Africa, about that. So, Drishti, you're not visible on my screen. Um, am I visible to everyone else? Yes, now you're now you're visible. Okay, there you go. Okay, so in the prose, it's written that only one night, and tomorrow she would leave this horrible town behind. Yeah. Why does Afro say that? Afros feels that it will take one night to just make make all peace with her mother, to say what she wants to say, and just leave. Because she believes that reconciliation is all about telling somebody everything that they did wrong to you and just turning around and walking away. But it's not the case. Reconciliation is actually about waiting to hear their side of the story. Because as the story progresses, Trishti, we realize the reasons why Sylvie had to behave the way she did. Afros saw it from a child's perspective that she was thrown out of the house in the middle of the night. But when we really read towards the end of the novel, we can see why Sylvie threw her out of the house in the middle of the night and sent her to safety to her father. Sylvie was um, hiding Afros away from a lot of pain and suffering that Sylvie went through. Sylvie was uh, going, she knew she was going to be jailed and she knew that the, the child is going to suffer. So Afros only sees it from a child's perspective. And uh, she knows, she thinks it's going to take one night and I'll go back to my fantastic life back in Cape Town. But it never works out that way. Yeah. So since you've mentioned about kind of a spoiler that Afros is pregnant, would yeah. she ever describe or narrate the whole story to her child about her mother and how she tried to, you know, make things fine with her when she was on her deathbed or why her mother called her only when she was on her deathbed? You know, that's such a wonderful question and I'll tell you why. I always wonder if I will ever narrate my life story to my daughter. You know, all, I've been through so much um, from being, from my, from my teenage years when I was in high school and being part of the anti-apartheid struggle. Not too much, but everything that I've been through in my life. And I always wonder if I'll ever tell the full story to my daughter or I'll just want her to be, um, to think of me as just an ordinary mother. I'm not an ordinary mother. I've realized that now. I've come to terms with it. I've gone to cover the war stories in different places. I've, you know, I've, I'm not an ordinary mother that my daughter sees amongst her friends. So I don't know. I, I think um, at this point, I, I would not tell my daughter the entire story because I know she's, my daughter's 12. And she's not going to be able to understand it. But what I'd love is for my daughter to one day uncover it for herself, you know, with all my diaries and all my journals and speak to all the people that I know. So I'm, I, I have this feeling that Afroza's daughter will do the same, where she's not going to sit, Afroza is not going to sit her down and say, okay, Betty, this is what happened and this is what happened and this. She's going to leave it for the, for the child to uncover because it makes for such an interesting child if they do things like that. So there's, yeah, that's how I feel. And what if like one day Afroza's daughter decides to leave the house for the betterment of the country? What would Afroza's point of view would be? Well, I think that's the thing is lots of people are leaving the country. You know, lots of South African Indians are running away from South Africa. It's a very, very big thing. Most people are saying they are cowards and they are running away from uh, that, you know, that now that the country is not uh, theirs, it belongs to the black people. Most of the Indians are going to Australia, New Zealand, UK, US. And just yesterday, I read an article about that. They call it the brain drain, right? But um, in defense of that, most of them are, are doing it because they don't, they don't feel like they are part of this country. And uh, there's a subtle racism against, you know, they say to us, it's a common thing that's being said, Indians go back to India. We've left India in the 1800s. How can we go back to India? Most people don't have ties with anybody in India. So when South African people say, Indians, you don't belong here, go back to India. We feel like we have no place and we actually start looking at opportunities to become migrants again. We started our generational lives. Our lineage is migration. Our lineage is 
moving like laborers from place to place. And now again, we have to move like laborers from place to place. It's a very, very difficult thing to face, but it's happening often. Yeah. Okay. So in one of the reviews of this book, it says that you have maintained the authenticity of the dialect and culture of lives of Tamil people in South Africa. Would you like to give yeah. our viewers some example of the lifestyle of Cape Malay people of South Africa? So the Cape Malay people um, are different. The, okay. the community that the Indian community here comprises largely the, the Tamil community. They are the majority. They came from Madras in the 1860s. And then uh, the North Indian community, which is my, my lineage, came a little bit later, you know, about, about 15 years later. And then the Cape Malay people are the slaves that came from Malaysia, which was in the early 1800s. So Malaysian slaves came and settled in the Cape, and they began to mix and mingle and intermarry. And so they formed a population called the Cape Malay people. So a little bit of a snapshot of them is that they have a Muslim, lots of them are Muslim because they came from Malaysia. But they have their own spicy flavor because they've mixed and mingled with Afrikaans, uh, Africana, Dutch people. They've mixed and mingled with the French settlers. So they are very much mixed, but they're very colorful. And the way they speak is extremely uh, descriptive. Uh, they're very warm people. And uh, you can't go to Cape Town without m uh, meeting and mixing with Cape Malay people. So that's Cape Town. Durban is different, completely different. And that's where I'm from. OK. So one of our viewers have a question. She wants to know, her name is Neha, and she wants to know your views on the apartheid system. Hi, Neha. Um, I think that the apartheid system was one of the most atrocious and uh, dehumanizing uh, systems that was ever created, but I think it found its roots in colonialism. So colonialism came first. Uh, whilst the British Empire was colonizing the entire world, including India, apartheid was just an offshoot when of, that the Dutch used when they came to South Africa. And what they used was a religious concept where in the Bible they interpreted it that some people are more superior to others. They took that interpretation and they created a system called apartheid. In Dutch, apartheid means apartheid, which means apartness. And I absolutely don't agree that anybody should be apart from anybody else. Um, I think everybody is part of humanity. And so the apartheid system did us, uh, it set this country back so badly but apartheid is being used all over the world. Apartheid is being used in Kashmir. Apartheid is being used in Palestine. And apartheid is simply one person is better than the next person. And I don't believe in that. So my last question to you, Zena, would be, when can mm -hmm. we expect your next book? And when are you planning to come to India? I was going to be in India, actually, while during this year, I was going to come for for uh, research for my new book. And my new book is set in India, uh, simply because I, I connect so deeply with India. And I've been there many times. So yes, if it had not been for COVID, I would have been talking to you in person right now. Instead of this online, it's so frustrating. But uh, yeah, I, my next book is coming out, uh, hopefully, in about a year's time. I'm still working on it. and. Um, I can't see you, Drishti, but I hope you can hear me. I can. Uh, I can. The book is very, yeah. The book is very much based on my experiences working with uh, Kashmir. So that's coming out, possibly in a year's time, and hopefully yes, I'll come so to I India. I think going to be very intense. Since it's very Kashmir. intense, but also it's very intense, but it's also very light because it uh, details the experience of the Kashmir journalist that was brought to South Africa. And uh, I had to, um, I was responsible for looking after him here in South Africa because he suffered um, some medical conditions whilst in Kashmir. I've basically given it away. <laughs> yes. 
yeah. thank you zainab for joining us i hope to thank see you, you super so much, super soon in india hopefully as soon as all the covid settles down i would love to come to nagpur and to india and i would love to visit thank you zainab ma'am and thank you drishti ma'am for this wonderful session it was a pleasure listening to you on behalf of orange city literature fest and sgr knowledge foundation we sincerely express our gratitude towards acceptance for this session and knowledge shared with us i would also like to thank our radio partner 92.7 pfm and publishers speaking tiger for the support Lastly, I thank our audience for attending this wonderful session. Our next session is changing face of Bollywood art, action, addition, and its effect at Taipei. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Twenty years, years of existence. Two universities. Twenty-three educational institutes. 137 courses. Sony Group of Institutions: A Vision Beyond.